By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back in Tilburg, the Netherlands, for the Edgeman Championships. This is a first time tournament held in Tilburg, the Netherlands. And uh, I'm looking forward to number two. I think it's already in the making. Uh, but for now, we're going to look at a match played in round number three of the Edgeman. And uh, we're going to look at a match be played between Elon, who's playing a blue, a white deck with Psychic Venoms, so I'm looking forward to look at the, the deck photo. And he's playing against Ruben, who's playing with black and green. A lot of smaller creatures, very aggressive strategy. Now, before I jump into the deck decks, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also choose to go to the games first, check out the deck decks later. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. If you click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And in that same description below, by the way, you can also find more information about the rules of this specific tournament. And you can find a beautiful link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page, because yes, yes, I've got my very own Patreon page. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks to find out how you can become a patron of the show and support Timmy Talks financially. This channel exists because of the patrons. So if you enjoy the content that I make, please take a moment to visit patreon.com slash Timmy talks. Okay, and now that you're fully informed, I'm going to start with the deck, uh, the deck decks. I'm going to start with the deck of Elon. Let's have a look. And here we see the deck of Elon. So this is blue and white, right? Really your traditional control color. And um, what I thought when I he heard that he was playing blue white, I'm like, okay, we're just going to have this standard deck, you know, of blue white. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's not that exciting. But then I looked at the list here and I thought, ooh, this is interesting. I'm liking what I'm seeing. Now, first off, the creatures that are good but you know kind of what you would expect you've got savannah lines play set you've got surrender perfect a play set as well and then you've got three sarah angels now this is a really good creature base for your deck right you've got your turn one lions you slowly work your way towards three mana while slowly in some cases you can already drop a surrender perfect turn two so that's not slow at all and it's a three four flyer like those are insane stats for three mana and then you have your sarah angel for five that comes a little bit later that's kind of your top end in the creature base but what i'm more interested in is the rest of the deck right we're seeing four um what i really like four psychic venoms and psychic venom is a card that i loved as a kid i mean that art that cobra it's just really cool but the card itself is also useful it's one of those cards where i think it has potential but does it really have potential you know is there really a deck where it could shine in obviously you want to combine it with icy manipulator or maybe some other tap effects and that's exa exactly what elon does here having your power sink and your icy manipulator they go together quite well with psychic venom maybe it's good to first kind of look at the card in case you don't know what it does it's one blue and one to cast for an enchant land that says whenever the uh, owner or controller taps the land for mana they get two damage so you play it on the land of your opponent whenever they use that land to take two damage if they have a city of brass it gets really fun because they take a damage from the brass and then two damage from the psychic venom so that's kind of like a dream scenario right and it's not that uncommon a lot of players are playing with city of brasses in their decks so if you've got your icy manipulator your psychic venom and your opponent has a city of brass you can do a lightning bolt of damage every single turn which is seriously pretty uh, huge also considering the fact that elon is playing with those creatures that i just talked about that are quite aggressive as well he's also playing with two psionic um uh, psionic blasts also so he can he can deal damage with that as well so that's quite nice one blue and two for instant speed for damage you do also take two damage yourself but i mean those are those are really good you know so he's got multiple weapons and i think when you're looking at the decks that do fairly well in today's meta are usually the decks that have multiple plans of dealing damage a lot of those decks they have the strategy of just playing quick creatures deal quick damage with those finish it off with a lot of direct damage and I'm liking this strategy more. I think it's a bit more classy to try to kill your opponent, maybe with the Psychic Venoms as well. It's a, You need to think a little bit more, you know, for that strategy. So that's why I kind of like it more. When we're looking at this list, the rest of the list, um, there are a few one-offs, right? We only have one counter spell. We only have one Mana Drain. Well, that's restricted, so that makes sense. One Ancestral Recall, one Balance, and then also uh, one Armageddon. And that's quite interesting, because you would think Armageddon and, and Psychic Venom is kind of a non-bow. But I kind of agree with Elon here that it's useful as a one-off. You know, if you time your Armageddon right, 
it can grant you the victory. Remember, he still has that very aggressive and, and strong creature suite in his deck as well, right? So sometimes you don't draw your Psychic Venoms or you don't really need them that much and you can go for your Armageddon and dominate it with your one Sarah Angel that's already on the board when you've cast that, that Armageddon or your Quick Surrender Befreed or something. So there could definitely be scenarios here where I can see that Armageddon being being very useful. I'm um, talking about cards that could be useful here. We also see two Wrath of Gods. So I think when we're looking at um, at this deck, Elon is expecting to encounter a lot of creature-heavy decks here. You know, three swords and two Wrath of Gods. It's really uh, heavy on the anti-creatures. Talking about creatures, we also have four Mistress Factories in here before I forget. It's almost an auto-include for most of the decks, but we also find it here in the list of Elon. So yeah, I'm looking forward to see this deck. I'm hoping, keeping my fingers crossed, Elon, that you can demonstrate Psychic Venom in action with the Ice Manipulator, preferably, like I said, on a City of Brass, but then we first need to find out if your opponent is playing a City of Brass. So let's take a look at the list of Ruben. And here we see the deck of Ruben, and oh no, there are no City of Brasses in the deck. Oh, well, I mean, it, you know, he could still do a lot of fun with the Psychic Venom, I'm sure. Putting it on a Mishra's Factory, for example, or in one of those Pendle Havens could be quite good. Um, yeah, this is your mono green aggro strategy. It's It's got a little bit more like fatties in the deck than you would see usually in a mono green, so that's quite interesting. And I mean... The, the Pendlehaven that I just talked uh, talked about, that's going to be still very, very strong in this deck. Pendlehaven, a card from Legends, a legendary land. You can tap it for a green, but you can also tap it to give target 1-1 one, one creature plus 1 plus 2, which is, I still find that insane. That it's not just plus 1 plus 1 or plus 1 plus 0, which would already be good, but it's plus 1 plus 2. I mean, it's insane. Um, and he can use that only on his 1-1s, one though. So you've got your Lanterer Elves, your Elves of the Deep Shadow, and your Scavenger Folks. who have got 10 1-1s one in the deck. So, I mean, you've got enough targets for your Pendle Havens. Now do remember it's a legendary land, meaning you can only have one in play, but one of the tricks that you could do with it is if you have one in hand and one on the board, you can tap your Pendle Haven, pump one of your creatures. Let's say you've got a scavenger folk, make that a two, three, then play your second Pendle Haven. That means that your tap Pendle Haven will probably have to leave. So it's gonna go to your graveyard, but then you have a new fresh untapped Pendle Haven to use maybe on another creature and pump another one one of yours when you go in for maybe a big attack, right? Talking about big attacks, I think the strategy of this deck is pretty plain, right? Um, you just wanna cast your creatures, ramp up with Elves of Deep Shadow and Lanterer Elves, try to get your bigger creatures out as fast as you can and turn them sideways. We've got four Urnum Jins. Urnum Jin. An amazing creature. It's a 4-5 for four, 4. I mean, those are insane stats. It's got one little drawback, and that is that in your upkeep, you got to give one of your opponent's creatures Forest Walk. And I mean, yeah, who cares? Because this is an aggressive strategy. So your opponent wants to keep their creatures to block your creatures. So that Forest Walk usually doesn't really matter uh, that much. So at the time, it was thought of a huge drawback because you're making one of your opponent's creatures unblockable. But in reality, who cares? It's just a really, really good card. Um, talking about good cards, we also see two If Biff and Freed's here in the deck. I'm loving that. So If Biff and Freed, uh, two green and two to cast, also from the Arabian Nights, a 3-3 three, three flyer with a built-in hurricane mechanic that also your opponent can use. So you can pay one green, deal one damage to each uh, opponent and yourself, so each player, I should say, and also each creature with flying. So if your opponent also has green, they can actually kill your If Biff and Freed. But luckily, in this case for Ruben, uh, you know, uh, um, Elon doesn't have any green, I believe. So that's good news for him. Talking uh, about colors, it's actually not a mono green deck. It is a black and green deck. So, sorry, made a little mistake here. We see um, people splashing black more often in green because it gives you access to, I guess in this case, sinkholes. And also there are ice storms in here. But more importantly, a lot of players do that. So it gives them access to terror. Um, the interesting thing here is we don't see the terror in the sideboard here of Ruben. So I find it quite interesting. Talking about the sideboard, it is super aggressive, right? I think those are the cards there at the bottom. We see like four Vice, two Copper Tablets, Ankh of Mishra, uh, three Ankh of Mishra actually. Um, so yeah, it looks really aggressive. Tranquility there, Tsunami. Ooh, I don't like Tsunami. I've got nightmares about Tsunami. Um, and then we have two Icy Manipulators. So really a very artifact-heavy strategy on the side. So I wonder if he's going to rebuilt a little after game one so we're gonna just wait and see i think one of the things that ruben has to be scared of post board is the um city in the bottles of elon i believe he's playing with two in the sideboard so that could become an issue for him uh because that can of course take care of his of his urnum army and his if biff free so that could be something that maybe in the back of his mind he thinks okay i'm gonna take them out i'm gonna play maybe some of those artifacts instead but i'm really curious to see 
if he's gonna like rebuild because I, I I can see uh, after po you know post board that he maybe chooses to put in the vices because the black vice works really well with the uh, land destruction strategy of single and ice storm you know we've got four ice storms here and two sinkholes um, so, so there are some interesting things happening here with the deck so I wonder if Ruben has a plan I guess. The only way to find out is by going to the actual game. So this is round number three of the Edgeman. We've looked at the deck of Elon. And this is the deck of Ruben. And we are ready. Let's go to the games. Game number one. Here we go. We've got Elon on the play. So he's playing white blue with the Psychic Venom. Starting with a Mishra's Factory. Taking on Ruben who's on a black green. Mainly a green deck. But there's some black in there. There we see a Bayou. We're going to see a lot of our elves here. Exactly. He also plays with Elves of the Deep Shadow. There we go, there's the Elves of the Deep Shadow. This means next turn he can cast one of his Urnum Jins, playing with the full playset of those. Also playing with two If Biff Afrits, very powerful flyer from Arabian Nights. Let's first see what uh, Elon can do here, playing out a Chaos Orb, passing the turn. I believe Elon also plays with uh, Crumbles, so could cast a Crumble here, also a Scavenger Folk in the deck. There we see a Pendlehaven, so that works quite well with the 1-1 one, one creatures on board. There we see the Crumble taking care of business. It does mean 2 life here for Elon, it's going to go up to 22. Looks like he's studying the card for a moment there, making sure that he gets the life and not uh, Ruben. Now I wonder if we're going to see an Urnum or an attack for 3, or perhaps an Ice Storm. Gonna tap three, are we gonna see an Ice Storm here? Yep, there's the Ice Storm taking care of the Mishra's Factory. And there's the attack for one. So a very good turn here for, for Ruben, really taking care of the board on the side of Elon. And I think in this matchup, it's really up to Elon to, to try to survive the first couple of turns, get the game into mid game and then take over, stabilize. There we see a, a white source for him, a Tundra, passing the turn, so no Savannah lines. Wouldn't have done much on this board anyway with that Pendlehaven. So perhaps he's keeping it open to cast, for example, a storage to plowshares. There's another forest. Kind of out of sight, but we can just see it. Ooh, another ice storm. Counter spell on the ice storm. That's quite good, actually. Does mean that he's tapped down, but I think he really needed this one counter spell here, not to get further behind. He's only playing with one counter spell in the deck, by the way. One counter spell in the mana drain. Here we see the attack for three. So Elon is now on 18. But now he can get his third land, potentially cast a, a Surrender Befreet, which would be a great blocker here. There we go, there's the Surrender Befreet. So 3-4 Flyer, this is the revised edition with the wrong uh, artwork on it. And of course, uh, it's green, but it's blue, you know. Confusing a player since uh, 1995, or is it 1994 that revised got printed? I think it's 1995. Anyway, passing the turn, one damage here for Elon, so he's going to drop to 17. So the 3-4 Flyer is kind of stabilizing the board for him. And what would be really good here for, for Ruben would be one of his if for frites There's another land. And Ruben has, of course, that Mace of If as well. So if Elon wants to attack, he can send it back with the Mace. So that's kind of a new little, little problem for Elon, right? Who's like, okay... I've stabilized, but now what? I'm still taking a damage return from the Surrender. But then again, he's he's on 17, so I mean, he's got time. And he's also playing, of course, with the Icy Manipulators. Icy Manipulator, a great card against the Maze of If. In general, I find that card very, very handy. I mean, it is costly. You got to you got to tap for it to cast it, but once it's on board, it's it's pretty cheap to use with just one mana, and it's so versatile. You can do so many things. It looks like Elon here really in the tank, by the way. So, okay, there's a Plains. Now he's got enough to cast a Sarah Angel, for example. Ooh, he's going to animate. It's going to go into the red zone, attacking here. That is interesting because Ruben, of course, has the Pendlehaven. So I'm expecting some kind of sorts to plowshares here. So sending back here the Serenip first. Probably going to block and pump. Kind of expecting a sorts here, but still. I mean, I feel like you got to try. Ooh, he's going to double block. Interesting. And he's not going to use the swords. I like this strategy. So if... Okay, now he's going to use it. And then we've got still have the same situation. Because in response, of course... Exactly, there's the Psionic Blast. Like in response, he can kill. 
one of the creatures and now Dubin loses both so I guess it would have been better to just block with one use the Pendle Haven and if he has a removal spell let him use the removal spell you only lose a 1-1 one, one. but now he's lost both creatures that's pretty painful here for Dubin there we see another factory so I kind of expected Dubin here to maybe wait for the Psionic Blast in that previous turn or maybe just accept, okay, if you don't play it, I'm just going to trade two of my creatures for one of your factory. Anyway, there's a new attack. We've got a new situation. Again, we see the Pendlehaven sending back the Flyer. I mean, is he going to animate and trade? He's still pretty high up. He is going to trade. That surprises me a little bit. I, I would have expected him to just take two or go to 18. And I guess Elon, exactly, like he placed the Disenchant after animation before blockers are declared, so then the factory still deals damage. So it's not looking great for Ruben here. Not quite sure how many cards he's got in hand, but it cannot be that many. Gonna tap four. Okay, there's an Urnum. I mean, that can do something. There's the pass. And another damage for Elon. So he's actually already here on 11, so that's it's going quite fast. But Dubin's still on a very safe 18. Five lands for him. I mean, if it can find a Sarah, that would be huge. Gonna tap four. Ooh, there's an Icy. That's actually pretty good as well, because he can tap down the Urnum now. And then he can start attacking again. That Icy is very handy. And now, of course, he's got to give Force Walk to the Surrender Befreed. Passing the turn here on end step, tapping down the uh, Urnum. Yeah, this makes sense. He can now swing in with two, at least deal some damage. Or maybe he's got better options. Nope, animating here, swinging in with both. Then we're going to see the uh, Maze of If again, taking care of the Flyer. But it does mean two damage for Dubin, but I mean, he's still on 16. He's got some time. Going to draw for turn. Ooh, we're gonna we're gonna see him do something. Tapping three, maybe some more land removal. Nope, tapping four instead. There's the if biff of So this is interesting. So next turn he can start using the if biff to kill the surrender and also deal some damage to Elon. Elon being on ten, or maybe he just wants to use it as a blocker and he says, you know what? I'm fine. I just want you to keep taking damage from the surrender. So it's gonna be quite interesting to see. Okay, I guess we're not gonna see. <laughs> <laughs> what he wanted to do, unfortunately, because there's a quick sort. He can, of course, now still use it for to deal two damage, which is something I think I would do here. I mean, he's going to gain life anyway. Elon's on a lower life total. Yeah, I think this is a good decision. Just to, you know, try to deal as much damage as you can. But it's unfortunate because I was looking forward to see, you know, what line of play Ruben would have used if he would have said, I'm going to try to kill your surrender, or if he would have said, you know what, uh, I'm just going to deal two every time. Maybe that was the best line, actually. Just deal two damage every time and get Elon lower and lower. Anyway, it's not relevant because the if biff is gone. There's the attack with two. So it's going to, again, send back the flyer. Take two. Going to go to 15. Passing the turn here. Yeah, and for Ruben, the time is really ticking. It's not even untapping that Urnum here, saying, okay, you're going to tap it anyway. I know you're going to. Okay, there he goes. He untaps it. This is quite good. This scavenger folk, if it survives long enough, it could take care of the uh, of the Icy, and that can make a difference. So Elon here dropping to six. I mean, that Serenip is really eating away Elon's life total. And Ruben is still at a pretty healthy 15 here. That Mace is also doing a lot of work. I mean, this is this is tough, and I believe Elon also has no more cards in hand, so both players kind of top decking, I believe. It's hard to see, but I think they have no more cards in hand. So this is quite interesting. I mean, I kind of thought for the longest time that Elon would, would take the win, but now I'm not so sure anymore. Ooh, he's going to tap five, so does have cards in hand still. There's a Sarah Angel. That is pretty big. Still seems to have another card in hand there, so two cards for him. Now one card in hand, and he played out that Sarah Angel. Yeah, but this this is a very interesting first game. And now let's wait and see if Elon wants to do anything. 
There's the scavenger folk, and then of course, in response, we're going to see him probably exactly tap down the urnum. Or not, does he want to tap down the maze instead? Because he can also double block the urnum, of course, on the Sarah and the Serendip. This is a very interesting moment here. So he has to choose, am I going to tap down the maze or the urnum? If he taps down the maze, he knows he's going to have seven damage through the air. But then, of course, you know, there's a decision to make if Ruben would attack with the urnum. Anyway, he decides to tap down the urnum and Ruben's going to play another urnum gin. Okay, wow. This is a very exciting uh, first game here. This is super interesting. Like, this turn is going to be... Pretty big for Elon, right? He's gonna take a damage first, gonna go to five. Then he's gonna attack with the two flyers, and Ruben's probably gonna send back the angels. He's gonna take two, drop to 12, and then he can just attack with both of his Ernie's the next turn, which is pretty big. If you're Elon, you really wanna have like another Icy that would be great, or a way to deal with that uh, Maze of If. I think if I was Elon, yeah, he's kind of considering now also to keep the Surrender, not attack with it. So here we see the maze. And that means he's going to double block. Or he's going to chump block with the uh, Surrender. That could be a, a line of play as well. I mean, he's on five. He no longer wants to take that damage. Going to tap two here. Ooh, a Demonic Tutor. I'm just not trying to think, trying to think about the deck photo, but I can't really remember. Like, does he have, like, Hurricane or something in the deck to finish it off? And if Biff would be quite strong as well here. Even another Mace could be useful. I don't believe he's playing any Terrors in the main. So that wouldn't be an option, because then you could also say, I'm just going to terror the angel attack with both of my creatures. Although, then still, Elon could double block with the uh, Surrendip and the Factory, like trade basically one of his creatures for an Urnum, which wouldn't be great for him. So it's going to be an interesting moment here. Ruben's still on 15, so he could also decide to use the Maze more offensively in the attack here in his turn. So understandably, really taking his time here, trying to figure out what the best line is. But yeah, very, very exciting first game. I kind of felt like after that, I mean, it's, can I call it a mistake? Kind of that mistake with the double block from Ruben where he lost both of those creatures in that exchange. I felt like, ooh, is it going to be, you know, one of those games that you're just, you know, make a few unlucky decisions and end up losing quite fast. But that actually didn't happen. And now we're at this really, like, thriller moment in the matchup where we see, you know, Elon's on five, but he's got, like, these flying creatures, including that Surrender that's going to hurt him every turn. And we also see Ruben who's trying to find a way through because he's so close already. I really wonder what that card is. It's a strip mine. Ooh, look at that. It's going to strip the factory. Take care of a potential blocker, and now he's going to attack with both. I mean, yeah, I'm expecting the double block here by Elon, exactly. Is he going to use the maze? I mean, he could just use the maze, put him on one. Well, look at that, Elon realizing it. Wait a minute, I'm going to go to one if I do this. <laughs> this is not a good decision. He's actually forced to, uh, you know, block both of them here, I feel. Exactly, he's going to do this. He's not going to block the other Ernie. So in this case, I would use my mace to take the Ernie that's being blocked out of combat... So the Surrendip survives. He'll take four from your Urnum. He'll go to one. And then he dies. I think Ruben is slowly coming to that conclusion. Yes, he is. It's always easy from my position, of course, looking at these things. There's the attack for four. So that means Elon's going to go to one. And that's it. Then he dies. Elon saying, you got the game. Okay, game number one going to Ruben. And I really felt, like what I said, after that unfortunate block by Ruben, I felt, okay, this game is going towards Elon. But the good thing is here that, you know, Ruben managed to get back into it, clawed back into it. I think that Mace really played a crucial ro role. And also that uh, 
moment with the uh, scavenger folk right at the right time to take care of that uh, IC manipulator. That was pretty vital. So game one here goes to Ruben. Now both of these players are going to dive into their sideboards and we will catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two, here we go. Elon on the play after losing that first game, starting here with a Savannah Lions. This is what he wants to do. Passing the turn here to Ruben, and I'm expecting Ruben here to cast one of his many 1-1s. One and I'm also wonder like how he sideboard it. Remember, he's got that whole sideboard full of artifacts. I guess when you're on the draw, you're not gonna like board in vices and stuff, but we'll see. Here's the Bayou. There's the Mox Pearl tapping two. Are we gonna see an Ankh, for example? Nope. There's an Argovian Pixies, so the two one from Antiquities. And any damage dealt to it by artifacts is reduced to zero, and you can also not uh, block it with artifacts. So I wonder, yep, there's the attack, so kind of offering to trade here. I guess if you're Elon, you're not gonna take it. I mean, that Argovian Pixies is just too good against your uh, your Mishra's factories. But he is thinking about it. And he is taking the trade here, so does that mean that maybe he's got a nice storm to take care of that factory? Or he's thinking about another line of play. There's a factory of his own and a pass turn, so he doesn't have an, uh, an ice storm here. Let's see what Elon can do. If he can find a blue, okay, nope, can find another Mishra's factory, which is not too bad. It means you can attack here. There's another Savannah Lines instead. Deciding not to attack could offer to trade to Ruben, but uh, it may make sense that he doesn't. He can also wait until he has, for example, a disenchant, then decide to attack, keep wide open for that. But uh, first, let's see what Ruben can do. There's an Urnum here, which is pretty good on this board. It's a 4-5. Let's see if Elon has an answer for it. He's playing, of course, with Swords to Plowshares. And he's also playing with City in a Bottle, so I wonder if Elon boarded in the City in a Bottles. That would be quite good here as well. We see a blue mana here being played out, perhaps a Surrender Pefrit. Looks like he's a little bit in the tank. He's gonna tap two. Ooh, there's a Psychic Venom. Okay, there we have the Venoms. I almost forgot about them, to be honest, because we didn't see them at all in Game 1, but I'm happy to see a Psychic Venom here making an entrance. And there's the pass. So I think in this case, I would have kept uh, the planes open, by the way, keep it untapped, to at least pretend to have maybe a Swords in hand. So I guess Ruben is going to attack here. Is he going to use... Ooh, he's going to take damage from the Venom. I'm excited. Venom doing work. Ruben dropping to 18. Going to tap some more stuff. There's an Icy Manipulator. Also a Pendlehaven there all the way at the back. He's going to use it. Is he going to tap down the line? That makes sense. Then swing in with the Urnum. The thing is, if you if you tap down one of the factories in response, Elon can take a mana out of it, pump the other. Then he'll have a 2-2. Two -two. Then again, the, the factory there that's still untapped is the one with Summoning Sickness, so it doesn't make sense to animate and try to double block because it cannot pump itself with Summoning Sickness. So here we saw the, the Chum block here. And remember, Elon is also playing with Wrath of God, so maybe this Chum block indicates a potential Wrath. He's playing two of those main, I believe. Gonna tap a blue, Ancestral Recall, why not? Always a good card, always useful. So three new cards for Elon. I mean, if Elon can find a way to get rid of the Urnum, which, you know, White has a lot of ways to do that, and then he can find a way to get rid of the of the IC, he's really in a good, uh, good, good position, but of course those are two very, uh, very good cards that he has to deal with. Especially the Urdum, of course, being the, the most uh, threatening threat on the board because that actually deals damage. So Elon here, a little bit in the tank, of course, just picked up those uh, three cards with the Ancestral Recall. Is he thinking about animating, swinging in for four? 
It could be a line. Look at that. Look at Mr. Aggressor go here. Attacking for four. Going to put Ruben here on 14, I believe. There's the untap. And now, of course, Ruben has a clean attack with the Urnum. Could put Elon on 16, keep the Icy Manipulator at bay to maybe tap one of the factories. Or, of course, could decide a more uh, defensive line by just keeping the Urnum untapped. But I think with his deck, exactly, you kind of have to attack. I would almost be tempted to also animate the factory here, although you can use that factory then as a blocker next turn, and you don't want to take the two damage with that Psychic Venom. So he's passing the turn here, not doing much else. And there we see a, a tap down. Ooh, going for the planes in the upkeep probably. Quite an interesting choice. So he's saying, if you attack with a factory, fine. I'm just going to put my factory in front of it. But look at that tapping for control magic. Yeah, that's quite good on this board and really good against the black green deck. Not a lot of solutions for Ruben. Of course, he is playing with tranquilities in the side, but I wonder if he boarded those in. We didn't see a single uh, control magic in game one. Although it's something, of course, that you can expect, you know, if you're playing against decks like this. There's a forest. Going to tap four. I want to say three, but it's four. There's an Urnum Jin, a new one. Yeah, this is just really annoying if you're a Ruben, you're like, oh man, and I lose a creature and you gain a creature. Like, Control Magic is so good. And in a lot of cases, you're playing against like a Red Mage who has a Red Elemental Blast to take care of it, or against a White Mage who has Disenchant. But in this case, it's really good for Elon, because Ruben doesn't really have a quick fix. And I wonder if you board it in the Tranquility. We'll just have to wait and see. Because now we see and that Annoying Psychic Venom and that Control Magic. There's an island for Elon, by the way, taking his turn. Now remember, these creatures give each other forced walk. There's another planes. What is he gonna do? That's a big question. Looks like he's got four planes that are untapped, taps them. Another control magic. Oh, man. That is brutal. That is brutal. Tapping down to one Urnum that can attack, but still. Oh, man. That is a really, really, really big problem here for Ruben. And now I really hope, for his sake, that he's playing uh, with the Tranquility. There we see a Surrender Pefrit and a Pass. So this is really tough here for Ruben. Just finding a factory. Has some cards in hand though, so maybe there's an answer in there. Nope, passing the turn. Ay, 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 this is really tough. Elon is taking a damage here, of course, from his own Surrendip. But I mean, he's, he's still on a healthy 15, so it's not going to be a big problem, I think. And there's the tab down, I guess. Yep, so tapping down one of the Urnums. I wonder if those factories are going to see some action on the side of Elon. There's going to be an interesting combat here. If he attacks just with the Urnum and the Surrendip, Ruben can choose to double block with his factories. Could maybe trade one factory then for an Urnum. But well, let's first see, is Elon going to animate his factories? Or maybe he's got a disenchant in hand. That would be pretty disastrous for um, for Ruben. Ooh, there's another Psychic Venom first. Yep, wants to get full value out of it. There's the animate of one of the factories. And I think it's really good to see here that Elon is really taking his time before deciding what to send in here. Going to attack with a Mishra's Factory, a Surrender Befreet, and an Urnum Jin. And there we see potentially one of the factories being uh, animated and used to block the attacking factory. Could, of course, then use his other factory to make it a 3 3. Ooh, he's also going to animate the other one. 
Yeah, is he going to go for the double block? Because he can pump his own factory. The other one, make it a 3-3. Three, three. Then he'll have a... Uh, exactly. So now he's got a 5-5 five, five blocking the Urnum. But now, of course, he can still respond. So he's going to make that into a 3-3. Three, three. It's a bit of a mess here. I'm a little confused, to be honest, because I don't think both... Exactly, not both factories are going to die. Exactly, that's what's going to happen. The Urnum is going to die. One of the factories is going to die on the side of Ruben, and he's going to take two damage from the Psychic Venom. Then he's going to take six damage from the attack. So he's going to drop to six. Like, he's he's in trouble here. Needs to find some answers. Those lands... Nope, that's it. Showing his hand. That's all he can do. So this game is, uh, is going to go to Ruben... Or, sorry, to Elon... I guess. Oh no, there's a pass for a moment there. I thought uh, Ruben was giving up, but there's a pass instead. Maybe he can squeeze out one more turn. Of course, still has the uh, the factory to block, and he's got the IC. Tapping down the Urnum. There's the attack. Yep, I mean, he can survive another turn. Why not? Gotta put it in front of it. Can, can he? I mean, he can animate it, I think. Then it would go to four. Then take three damage, she's on one. So, I mean, no problem, man. You're still alive, go for it. Is there a card in his deck that can save him here? Like, if, if he was to play with white, I would say balance. Nope, that's it. Then, uh, yeah, I think there was nothing really in his deck that could save him from the, from the situation he was in. So, game number two is gonna go to Elon. That means we've got a 1-1, one, one. I love it. We are gonna go to game number three. Game number three, here we go. The Decider, round number three of the uh, Edge Man Championships. And here we see a card from the sideboard, Black Vice. So they've been playing that Vice, and Elon took a mulligan, so only takes two instead of three, so drops to 18. Playing out of factory, passes the turn. So let's see if he boarded out some more, or boarded in some more of those artifacts. There we go, another Vice passing the turn. I believe that means four damage next turn for Elon. Exactly, gonna drop to 14, so those vices doing work. And ideally here, um, you know, Ruben will have some land removal next turn to kind of slow down Elon some more. There we see a planes. If you're Elon, of course, you're looking for a disenchant here, perhaps. Or at least you wanna play something to empty your hand. Are we gonna see a Savannah Lines here? Which would be quite useful as well. So tapping the white, there's a Savannah Lines 2-1. And there's the pass, so that means only two more damage for Elon next turn, so he will drop to 12. There's a factory, and just a pass, no Ice Storm, and that's unfortunate here for Dubin. I really kind of felt that he needed that, really need to slow down Elon, because now probably he's going to play land number three and maybe, you know, cast like a Surrendip. So he's on 12 at the moment, Ruben's still on 20. Remember, this is the game decider, game number three. There's the attack with the uh, Savannah Lions. So Ruben here gonna drop to 18. Yeah, gonna go to 18 here. There's a tap for two. Are we gonna see a Psychic Venom? Perhaps on the factory. Ooh, is it Chaos Orp instead? Passing the turn. That is quite good here for Elon, having that option open and at the same time kind of emptying your hand, that's what you want to do. I wonder if we're going to see a land and perhaps an Urnum here from Ruben, he needs to put some pressure on. The Vices kind of did their work, right, dealt 8 damage, which I guess is pretty good value, but now you got to find other weapons to put some pressure on Elon. Knowing, of course, that if you play an Urnum, he's probably going to use the Chaos Orb against it, but yeah, the Chaos Orb needs to go sooner or later anyway. Gonna tap three. What's he gonna do for three? Does he have now an Ice Storm, for example? Ruben in the tank. Yep, there's the Ice Storm. Taking care of the factory, passing the turn. I, I understand that you need some time for that decision because it must have been tempting to kind of cut off white here as well. That could be an, a good choice, or blue for that matter. But kind of cutting off one of the two colors would be... Uh, an interesting option as well, but then again, the factory is the one that's gonna gonna deal damage. And factories are really, really strong, so makes sense to get rid of those as well. There's not really a 
a wrong decision to make here. It's just a strategical one. There's the attack with the Lions. Going to put Ruben on 16. And are we not going to see a land drop here? I don't think we are. That would be pretty good for, uh, for Ruben. Pretty bad for Elon. He really wants to have at least uh, three lands. It looks like he's not going to play a land this turn. Going to tap two here. Are we going to see a disenchant? There's a Psychic Venom. And I wonder if you're Ruben and you now have a Crumble, play that Crumble. I guess he doesn't. It's a really nice opportunity here if you have a Crumble to take care of that Chaos Orb. There's another Swamp. Or actually, it's his first Swamp. It's not another one. It's the first one. So Ruben on 16 at the moment, Elon on 12. Going to tap 3, or we're going to see another Ice Storm. That would be quite good if you can find another one. No Tranquility. So he did board in those Tranquilities. Taking care of the Psychic Venom. Going to animate attack for 2. Exactly, going to put him on 10. Passing the turn. I wonder if you're Elon, what you're gonna do. Like, you first wanna have Lance, right? Gonna attack here. Does it mean that he's gonna use his Chaos Orb against the uh, Mishra's Factory? Gonna tap two. There's a balance. Ooh, that is actually pretty good. The balance here. Although, is it? Is it? I wonder how many cards both players have in hand. It's really difficult to see. Is it just one card there for Ruben or two? Two cards for Ruben. So Ruben, I guess Ruben is going to lose a lot of lands, right? I would probably keep the Bayou, exactly, and just uh, and, and the factory, of course, because that's going to deal damage. But Elon here is going to lose his Lion. And he can also only keep two cards. So Control Magic, Wrath of God, gone. But I mean, they were useless anyway. I couldn't cast them. And This is not that bad for Ruben. I mean, you can still attack for two, put him on eight. And of course, next turn he could use the Chaos Orb. But hey, it is what it is. And then I wonder if you're Elon, I guess you would throw the Chaos Orb on the Bayou. He's not though, passing the turn. This surprises me a little bit. I expected him here to use the Chaos Orb on the Bayou, but maybe he's got better options. Perhaps he's got a Disenchant in hand, for example. There's the attack. Are we gonna see it? No, we're gonna see a Chaos Orb. I won't say there's the attack. Are we gonna see Disenchant? Instead, we're going to see Chaos Orb, Chaos Orb, Chaos Orb. Oh, man, this is interesting. I think if you're Elon, if you have to disenchant now, you probably want to fire it off on end step on the Chaos Orb here of Ruben. That's exactly what's going to happen. And then if I'm Elon, I would still consider flipping the orb on the Bayou. Instead, unless, of course, I mean, you have another disenchant in hand. Going to play Tundra here. He is going to activate the Chaos Orb. Yeah, exactly. You gotta gotta go for the dual land here. And I can is that a full flip? I guess it was. Both players agreeing here, so the land is a goner. And I mean this is bad news for Ruben. If he can just oh he is finding at least a mana source. Can at least attack. Oh, there's the sword to plowshares. Yeah, this is really unfortunate for Ruben. I really felt like he needed that little bit of luck here. Push through the extra two points of damage. He is going to go up to 16, but that doesn't really matter. This is really a game about mana now here in game number three. Remember, the winner takes the match win here in round three of the Edge Man. Untapping the Pearl. There's a strip mine. I guess it would strip the duel exactly. There's a Black Lotus. Okay, what are we going to see? Second, the Lotus. Oh, there's an Erdem. I'm really enjoying this this match and this game three. Erdem here, slammed down by Dubin. Can this bring him the victory? Elon on eight on a two-turn clock here. Needs to find an answer. Tapping three. There's a Surrender, but at least it's a blocker. There's a Mace. Ooh, now he can also decide not to attack, just use the Mace. Attacking here. Surrender down, passing the turn. 
Can Elon find an answer? Needs a second blue for control magic. There's a Wrath of God. Whoa. This game is exciting. Remember, I believe he's only playing two Wraths main, and there was already a Wrath in the graveyard, so uh, quite lucky here finding that Wrath. Then again, he's got a lot of answers to creature threats with the two Wraths and the three swords to plowshares, and of course, also the uh, Icy Manipulators. Another Vice here, not going to do much. There's a Psychic Venom here on the maze, yeah. Really nice target for it, by the way. Passing the turn. So both players kind of top decking. Ruben looking for lands and Elon looking for threats. Ooh, this is quite good. The IC can start tapping down the maze, dealing damage. There's a soul ring. Soul ring into. Is he maybe having Ank of Mishra in hand and deciding not to play it out? That would kind of make sense in a way, I guess, because you don't want to take damage, right? Because you're going to play out your lands. Then again, you're pretty high. Exactly, Ank of Mishra here. It's understandable that Ruben needed a moment for this play. There we see a Lance going to drop to six, going to tap five. Sarah Angel. Ay, 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 ay. This is starting to get really tough. Remember, the Maze of If of Ruben has a Psychic Venom on it. It's looking quite good here for Elon, really finding more Lance than, uh, than Ruben. That is the big difference after that balance. So we're going to see. What's going to happen? Passing the turn. Is he going to attack? Tapping down the maze first. Yeah, then you take two damage from the maze. And you take two damage from the Sarah. And of course, animating. Wow, six damage. So you take eight in total here. Now six coming in. So you're going to end up on eight. This is a brutal turn. So next turn, it could be over already for Ruben. Ay, 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 that is pretty disastrous. Like the IC, the Sarah, and the factory, it's just too much. He's on eight, which seems a pretty high life total, but he's probably going to die because I expect Elon here to tap down the maze. He takes two, drops to six, animate attack. That's it. Elon winning here the match in round number three of the Edge Man. So congratulations, Elon, winning this match here. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a like, a comment, and share it on your socials. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. And talking about moving forward, if you're not subscribed yet, please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. And if you enjoyed this episode, there's more good news because next week I will be back with more action from this tournament. So keep an eye on the channel if you want to follow more action from The Edge Man. And before I sign off here, I'd like to mention one more thing. And that's, of course, the Timmy Talks Patreon page. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks to find out how you can support the channel as a patron. It already starts for just $1. And for that $1, you get access to the Timmy Talks Discord channel. You can join in in all the online uh, tournaments that I organize. And your name will be mentioned at the end of every single video in the end scroll. What end scroll? This end scroll. Just think it is somebody.